Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, reading through verse 11. The word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. If you bow your heads with me one more moment today. Father, once again, God, we come to you in prayer. We are so grateful for the word of the Lord. We're so grateful, God, today for the presence of the Holy Ghost. We're grateful, God, today that you are real to us and our relationship with you is so very real. We get strength from the Word of God. We get encouragement from the Word of God. Hope is born in our hearts even in the most hopeless of times by reason of the Word of God. Master, today I stand humbly before you in this sacred desk understanding Lord as I so often say without the anointing of the Holy Ghost there is not anything I can offer the people of God that would benefit them the Lord today I implore you to anoint this simple man anoint my mind anoint my lips anoint my spirit today that I might deliver unto the people the word that you've given me the word of instruction the word of exhortation that you've given me for them at this hour. Oh God, help it to find its mark. Help it, Lord, to be received upon good ground that the seed of faith might break forth and bring forth, Lord, fruit unto righteousness, holiness, and godliness. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Peter admonishes the church in 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant. This is not something you can take carelessly. This is not something... You can approach passively. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, you have an enemy today, folks. You and I have an enemy. We have an adversary today. The devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I'm going to tell you, it breaks my heart when Tommy and I watch some of these paranormal television shows. And I see people experiencing things in their homes. I see people experiencing things in their bodies. I see people experiencing things in their lives. And they go to churches. They go to men and women of God seeking assistance, seeking help, seeking deliverance, seeking instruction. And they're told by church men, mind you, that there is nothing they can do. It is a sad state of affairs today that the church of Jesus Christ, even many if not most in the Pentecostal and apostolic movements, are so lacking 
in an understanding of spiritual warfare, the nature of spiritual warfare, the tools that are to be used in spiritual warfare. It is said today that the church is incapable of helping people who are being attacked and devoured by the enemy. It breaks my heart. Tommy can tell you how many times have I watched and I've said, Dear God, I wish I could get hold of that person. I know that we could help them. I know we could do something for them. But unfortunately, the majority of churches today do not even teach on spiritual warfare. They do not even teach on things related to uh, what many refer in the, in the world today as paranormal activity and supernatural activity. Uh, many acknowledge it at some level, but then they offer nothing in the way of instruction or teaching as to how to combat it or how to walk in victory over it. But today the Spirit of God inspired my heart and said it is imperative that God's people be instructed in this matter. Peter said in his epistle, Be sober, be vigilant. He said, keep your eyes open. Don't allow yourself to become spiritually intoxicated. Don't allow anything to interfere with your abilities uh, to see clearly and to reason and to function as you ought to. And be vigilant. Be ever mindful. Don't, don't forget for one moment that this is something you need to be concerned about. I'm not teaching today, I'm not preaching today to create a sense of terror or fear in anyone, nor am I trying to tell us that we need to be in a constant state of concern. There is not a demon behind every tree. And every tree does not hide a demon. However, they are real. Spiritual influences are real. They exist in our world. Every day we see things on the news that are troubling. Every day we see things uh, in the newspapers that cause us to wonder what in the name of God is happening there. How can a mother kill her own children? How can a father shoot and kill his wife and kids? How in the world can the horrors that humanity visits upon itself, how, how can this even be possible? How do these things happen? Not everything is caused by demonic influence, but I will tell you this today. Many of those things are caused by that very thing. Children of God today need to be sober. They need to be vigilant. They need to be educated. They need to be well taught. You need to be in a church that offers a well-rounded diet of spiritual instruction. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, folks. Um, I don't say this to elevate myself or to elevate our church or my ministry above anyone else. But I will tell you this. Uh, I know of precious few churches, even as a child growing up, that did a very good job of offering a really sound, solid, balanced diet of teaching and preaching. Oftentimes, the preaching in some churches leans toward preaching people happy. Oh, it's all about preaching people happy. Then you got other churches where they focus on what God can do for you. We call it prosperity doctrine. We've got other churches that seem to focus on this aspect or on that aspect. But they don't offer a well-rounded and balanced diet. And the people of God suffer for it. Today I'm offering something that we seldom hear about concerning spiritual warfare. You have an enemy 
There is a spirit in our world that the word of God refers to as the devil. And he is the enemy of your soul. And he, like a roaring lion, is always on the prowl for his next meal. And for this reason, the Apostle Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, roameth to and fro, seeking whom? He may devour. Notice it doesn't say he roams around devouring. No. He said he roams about doing what? Looking for whom he may devour. You see, Satan, like a lion, is an opportunistic hunter. Satan does not jump on the strong. He does not jump on those who are capable. He does not jump on those who are in perfect health. No, like a lion, he looks for that one that is old. He looks for that one that is weak. He looks for that one with a broken leg or with some ailment that would disable them and not allow them to function normally and properly. He looks for that elk or he looks for that Gazelle, or he looks for that water buffalo that has separated itself from the rest of the pack and is all by itself lonesome elsewhere. I'll tell you, if you think you don't need the church today, I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it. You're a fool. You are an idiot beyond measure. I'm just going to tell it the truth today because I'm tired of this foolishness. I'm tired of the stupidity that I hear coming out of people's mouths. I can be a Christian. I don't need church. I can be a child of God. I don't have to go to church. You're a liar, devil, and I rebuke you. That is garbage. That is stupidity. That is foolishness. You have bought into a lie of the enemy, and honey, he is laughing all the way to the dinner plate. He loves God's people when they separate themselves. He loves God's people when they isolate themselves. When demons begin to work and they begin to vex people and they begin to bother people, you'll notice that one of the first operations of demonic influences is they will do everything in their power to separate you and to isolate you. Watch these programs on TV and see people who claim claim to be experiencing hauntings or who claim to be experiencing demonic vexation and you will find that they alone are seeing things they alone are experiencing things nobody in the house nobody else is seeing these things or experiencing these things and they become they begin to pull away from everyone else because they feel so isolated and so alone in their experience nobody understands what i'm going through nobody else has seen what i'm seeing and they begin to isolate and they begin to pull away that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do because then like an antelope you have wandered away from the pack folk there is an old saying that says there is safety in numbers. Right. A lion will not jump into a herd of gazelle, or he will not jump into a herd of elk. He will not do that because, tell you why, he's not stupid. He knows that the fear that he would inspire is going to cause a stampede. And that stampede can hurt him. They can trample him dead. He's not stupid. He said, no, 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 no. If all those are gathered over there and they're tight-knit, I don't want to jump into the middle of that because I'm going to wind up getting trampled. I'm going to wind up underfoot and under hoof. No, I need to look for that one that's isolated. I need to look for that one that separated itself. I need to look for the one that's blind or the one that's deaf or the one that's sick or the one that's wounded or the one that is weak. Our adversary, the devil, the apostle Peter tells us, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But Peter encourages us, whom resist 
steadfast in the faith. Hallelujah. You know, I've watched a number of videos on YouTube and various video uh, channels on the Internet. And one of the things that always amazes me is not every hunt that a lion engages in, not every uh, animal that he seeks to make prey of uh, winds up falling to his attack. No, I've seen a number of gazelle fight and fight and fight. And you know what? They got loose and they ran away. Oh, they might have been wounded a bit. They might have been hurt a bit. But they lived through that attack. They lived through that experience. I've seen lions try to attack elephants when a whole group of lions would try to attack an elephant, a small elephant. And that elephant would fight back. And next thing you know, he's running off safe. Oh, honey, don't think just because the enemy is like a roaring lion that the minute he comes at you, you immediately are going to lose the battle. No, you're not. The apostle Peter said, Whom resist ye steadfast in the faith. Hallelujah. Resist! Resist! Don't just get into him. Don't just assume that because you're being attacked, you will be destroyed. That is not at all the case. But resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Honey, there's nothing you're going through that somebody somewhere hasn't gone through or isn't going through even at this very hour. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while, or you may get attacked, you may be wounded, you may leave bleeding, but after you have suffered a while, God will make you perfect, he'll make you mature, he'll make you complete, he will strengthen you, and he will settle you. You know, there is nothing more unsettling than a surprise attack. My mother got attacked one time working as a police officer with the Dallas County uh, Community College District. And a young man that had been arrested by the uh, college police uh, attacked her, scared her to death. Well, I'm going to tell you. God is able to settle you. After it's all over, hello now, God's able to give you peace. After it's all over, oh, when, when it's happening, you're going to be rattled. While it's happening, you're going to be nerved up. While it's happening, you may have anxiety. But praise the name of the Lord, God is able to settle you. Hallelujah. When it's all over, God is able to restore your peace. He's able to restore your joy. He's able to restore your sound mind. Glory to the name of the Lord. He's able to establish you, to perfect you, and to strengthen you, and to settle you. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 today, the Word of God said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you're trusting in your own strength, honey, you've got problems. If you're trusting in God's strength, then you've got victory. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I want to tell you we have a spiritual enemy. He may be invisible. He's not flesh and blood. There is no person on this planet who is your enemy. There is no organization or group of people on this planet who are your enemy. Even the church of Satan today is not our enemy. 
No, they worship our enemy. They serve our enemy. They may do his bidding, but they personally are not our enemy. Amen. Our enemy is the spiritual enemy. Our enemy is an organized enemy. Our enemy today has a structure and a chain of command. I want to tell you something. Satan and demonic influences, if you've been uh, privy to some of our teaching in the past on spiritual warfare and uh, things of this nature, then some of this will be uh, things you've heard before. For those of you that have not, you may be hearing it for the first time. But Satan works in the realms, listen to me, of human emotion. The devil does not take over your body and make you do things. That is not how the enemy works. And it's not about you're this empty sock puppet and the devil just crawls in and makes you know. There's an old saying they used to have said, oh, the devil made me do it. You know, people do something bad and they say, oh, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. But what happens is this, and listen carefully now. I'm just going to instruct today. Satan is structured. There is a chain of command. He can only come into a life, he can only begin to operate within a human life when a door has been opened to him. Now that door may be opened uh, cognitively. Someone may purposely open the door. Or that door may be left open and that person really just wasn't being careful and wasn't paying attention. When I let my dogs out every day to go to the bathroom in the backyard, I do not leave my door ajar. I shut my door and I lock it. Say, well, pastor, why do you do that? You're going to come back in a few minutes and let them back in. Yes, but you know, seeing those dogs in the backyard may tell somebody who's got bad thoughts and bad ideas, well, hey, if they let them out, they're going to have to let them in. So maybe they left their door ajar. Maybe they left their door open. And then they'll want to come in and test and see if they can make their way in. If I leave that door ajar, then I go to the restroom, or if I go to the bedroom on the other side of the house, I have no idea what's going on over here. For all I know, somebody who's wanting to rob, someone who's wanting to murder, someone who's wanting to visit evil upon us, can easily just walk right in. Because I carelessly left the door ajar, or left the door open. So I don't do that. When I come into the house from outside, even if I'm working in the backyard and what have you, if I come into the house through the garage, I shut the garage door behind me. I don't leave that garage door wide open. No, because I know that it'd be too easy for somebody to come in and then enter the house by reason of the door that connects the house to the garage. So therefore, I'm vigilant. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I shut doors behind me. I make sure those doors are locked. Because I don't want to make it any easier for anybody who's up to no good than I need to make it. Well, I've got news for you today. The devil, Satan, and his minion, they work in the same identical fashion. They look for an opening. They cannot push their way in. They cannot force their way in. But they look for an opening. All they need is for someone to embrace a thought process or to embrace a response to a life circumstance or to a situation that is contrary to God and contrary to God's way. And they see an opening. Ah, oh, wait a minute. This person is beginning to question God's sovereignty. This person is beginning to question whether God really genuinely will work everything for the good in their life. You say, really, Pastor, something as small as that? If I question whether or not God is in control, if I question whether or not everything that occurs in my life, God has the ability to create a victory from the ashes, that that is an opening? Absolutely. 
Because here's how spiritual influences work. They come in according to pay grade. They come in according to their status and their stature in the military lineup, as it were. You start out with privates, and then you go up the line to corporals, and you go up the line to sergeants, and you go up the line to captains, and I don't know military lineup very well. But, you know, all the way to generals. And what spiritual influences will do is they will look for the smallest opening. All I need is a little hatred. All I need is a little anger that I'm not keeping in check. All I need is a little malice. All I need is a little lust. You see, if we allow, it's, it's not a sin, it's not a horrible thing that bad thoughts go through our minds. It's not a terrible thing that every once in a while we experience temptation or what have you. No, the problem is in how we respond to these things. Amen. What did Peter tell us? He said, whom resist ye? steadfast in the faith. I'm not going to give myself over to hate. I'm not going to give myself over to anger. I'm not going to give myself over to malice. I'm not going to give myself over to bitterness. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm a child of God, and I know that if I leave the door open a crack with these issues, that I'm inviting influences into my life that I don't want there. And every influence that comes in, including the smallest, tiniest one at the onset, their job then becomes to open the door wider and wider and wider. Their job is to make it easier then in your life for a higher up, more powerful spirit to enter and to vex you at an even higher and greater level. You may start out with a spirit of fear. And then before too long, you wind up finding yourself uh, isolating yourself from people, isolating yourself from environments. And all of a sudden you find a spirit of depression moving in. See, depression is one step up from fear. Then after a while, all of a sudden, you find yourself being overtaken by suicidal thoughts. And it's almost as if a voice is standing behind you constantly encouraging you to end your life. Why? Because a suicidal spirit has now moved in. You see, they followed according to their strength and ability. They followed as they went up the hierarchy. You started out with a spirit of fear. Then it, 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 we had a spirit of uh, depression or loneliness move in. Then a spirit of depression and then a spirit of suicide. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? The same thing can happen, happen with a spirit of jealousy. You, you know, jealousy seems like such a small issue. But jealousy, my friend, can be... A powerful thing. See, you don't need an enormous powerful spirit to come in at first. All you need is a spirit. It doesn't matter how small it is. Once it gets in, its job then is to exacerbate. Its job is to cause you to open the door to even greater, more powerful spirits. So you may have a spirit of jealousy. And if you don't keep that jealousy intact... If you in check, if you don't keep that jealousy at bay, if you don't take victory and authority over that jealousy, then after a while you may find a spirit of anger moving in. Now, not only do you get jealous, but you become extremely angry. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? And then you may wind up with a spirit of murder that follows. How many people have committed murders in response to jealousy? It started out as jealousy, but it ultimately lent itself to anger. It lent itself to malice, and it ultimately ended with murder. The Word of God tells us, the thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. Everything demonic powers do, their objective is to steal, 
to take something from you that you need, something that you require. The Word of God said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I'm going to tell you something. The enemy loves to try to steal your joy. The Word of God tells us that Jesus said, peace give I unto you, not as the world give, uh, giveth, give I unto you. He said, but my peace, I'm going to tell you something, the enemy loves to take your peace and leave you unsettled and leave you anxious. He loves to steal your peace. He loves to steal your joy. He loves to steal the assurance of salvation. How many people wind up becoming terrified? I, I had members of my own family who served the Lord for 60 years full of the Holy Ghost. And when they went to their grave, they, went, they were dying, screaming out, uh, terrified of death. Why? Because that sense of assurance of their salvation had been stolen. They weren't facing their grave. They weren't facing death with an assurance that I'm going to close my eyes in this life and wake up in the presence of God. Hallelujah. They didn't have that mindset because the enemy had somehow stolen that from them. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. How we respond and how we react to circumstances in this life makes all the difference in the world as to whether or not we allow a spiritual influence, a negative spiritual influence, to make its way into our life. Now, my family, a member of my family that I love dearly, recently experienced one of the most horrific tragedies that I can even imagine. And if there is any young man on this planet that I would have jumped in front of a train to prevent from having to experience anything like this, this young man, I, I would have done it. My cousin, I would have done it for him. He's a terrific kid, bless his heart. He's always tried to do right. He's always tried to live right. He's always tried to conduct himself in the right fashion. All of a sudden now he has one daughter dead, teenage daughter, 15 years old, just taken out of this life so quickly, so tragically. He has a seven-year-old son lying in a hospital with a bullet wound to his back. His spine's been injured. He may never walk again, according to the doctors. And this poor kid is having to go through this experience uh, alone. His wife and he have now been separated by circumstance. I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm not trying to uh, spill all his business. His heart is broken. This is a tragedy that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. And yet today, even in the face of such tragedy, it is imperative that we guard our hearts. It is imperative that we be sober. It is imperative that we be vigilant. At this moment in time, he is vulnerable. At this moment in time, he is wounded. At this moment in time, he has been gravely bruised and his heart is broken. That makes him susceptible to the enemy. Well, I'll tell you, if you think the devil plays fair, you're out of your mind. If you think the enemy is going to look your way and say, you know what, that poor guy's been through enough. I'm going to leave him alone today and let him work through all this. No, 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 no. There's not a lion in the world that hunts in that fashion. There's not a lion in the world that exercises the least bit of compassion on his prey. Am I telling the truth today? No. In your worst moment, the enemy is going to pounce. So in every circumstance, no matter how little, no matter how big, it is imperative that our response be a biblical, measured, Christian, Christ-like response. Somebody says, well, pastor, that's awful hard to do. Of course it is. I'm here to tell you today, living the Christian life is not for the 
weak. Living the Christian life is not for those who have no backbone. If you're going to live this thing, it's not always going to be easy. There are going to be times when we have to respond to things in a way that completely contradicts everything that might be going on within us emotionally. I remember when I was lying in the hospital bed in New Haven, Connecticut in 2000. I'd been on life support for weeks. I was intubated. I couldn't talk, obviously. Had tubes down my throat. Had tubes everywhere. It wasn't any function of my body that uh, I didn't have some tube associated with. And I lay in that hospital bed and my brother Michael had brought in a picture of the Lord. As I recall, I believe he was walking on the water in this picture. And he put it up in the hospital room where I could see it from my bed. And I looked up at that picture and I remember thinking to myself, I have never in my entire life felt more empty, felt more abandoned, felt more hopeless. I have never in my entire life been in a place where the presence of God was not to be found. But at that moment in time, hooked up to life support and, you know, machines helping me breathe and monitoring my heart and all these noises and beeps around me, experiencing delusions, experiencing uh, uh, seeing things because of the drugs they had me on. And I sat there and I remember thinking, God, I don't feel you. I, I'm so used to feeling the presence of the Lord. I'm so used to feeling you, Lord. When in good times and in bad, I, I'm so used to being able to call upon you and feel the presence of God come down and envelop me and comfort me and encourage me. And I said, Lord, I, I don't feel that now. I don't feel you. I don't feel like you're here. But here's the important part. <laughs> Then I said, now mind you, I couldn't say it with my mouth. I was speaking in my mind. And I said, but Lord, I know you're here. I know you're with me. I know for a fact I don't have to feel you for you to be here. You said, hallelujah, you said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. Lord, you said... That whether I'm in hell, you're there. Whether I'm in heaven, you're there. That there is nowhere, any place, any time, anywhere that I can go and escape your presence. And I said, Lord, I choose to believe the word of God. I choose to believe what you have stated. I'll tell you, too many Christians wind up opening the door to influences demonic and influences of a negative nature because they respond to circumstances and situations not with the Word of God. They don't stand upon the Word of God, but rather they allow themselves to be swayed by emotion. It's all about what they feel at that time. No, 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 no. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I'm going to put my confidence in the word of God regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I'm going through. I'm going to tell you, if you learn to operate in this fashion, I've got news for you. You will not be prey to the enemy. If you learn to live where every moment and every circumstance and every trial and every tribulation that comes your way, you respond to it in a godly, scriptural manner. I'm going to tell you, the enemy will never find an open door. He will never find an opening whereby he might come in and further vex and torment you. We look at Job as an example in the Old Testament. Of a man who exemplified grace in time of great trials. He was told he lost all his children. They had all been killed. He had 
been told he lost his animals, his livelihood. He had been told that his life was literally littered upon the ground and he was left in utter destruction. Job easily could have said, Lord, I don't understand. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But instead, in Job chapter 1 and verse 21, listen to Job's response. And Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, the devil was attacking Job like nobody's ever been attacked in the history of humanity. And Job never forgot that the word of God was worth standing on. Job never forgot that his response and his reaction to that circumstance and that dilemma and that trial would determine whether or not the enemy had an open door. And Job said, no, you know what? I came into this thing naked. I'm going to leave this thing naked. He said, the Lord gave. The Lord took away. Notice he didn't blame the enemy. But who took everything away? It wasn't God. God gave the enemy permission to do it, but it was the devil who did it. But you see, Job took the glory out of the devil's hand. Oh, the devil loves nothing more than Christians run around saying, Oh, look what the devil's doing. Oh, the devil's tormenting me. Oh, the devil's giving me such grief. Oh, I'm telling you, the enemy is just... And I, mean, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I've heard that crap so much, it's enough to drive you crazy. They sit there and they don't realize that every time they say this, Satan is sitting there saying, thank you, thank you, testimony, thank you. Oh, we're having a testimony service. Everybody's giving me credit for everything I've done. Hallelujah, this is great. I like this. But we take his power away from him when we acknowledge that as a child of God, there is nothing in the world he can do to us. There is nothing in the world he can bring upon us except God first give him per the permission. That's right. Job said, no, the Lord gave. The Lord took away. And there stands Satan. What you talk about the Lord? The, well, how, how are you going to give him credit for what I've done? Well, I'll tell you, it takes the sting out, doesn't it? When you understand that God is in charge of your life. As a child of God and as a believer, God is in charge of your life. The devil can't vex you. People cannot curse you. No one can bring ill upon you because God is in charge of your life. You can stand on the word of God and know that you will have victory. In Job 13 and verse 15, listen. To Job's response, when others are encouraging him to just curse God and die, Job responds by saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. They're telling him, Job, God's done giving up on you, son. God's done allowed you to lose everything. Why don't you just curse God and go on and die? You ain't got nothing left. And what does Job say? Though he slay me, even if he kills me, yet will I bless him. Hallelujah. Yet will I trust him. Oh, my God, have mercy. Talk about having a biblical, godly response. To our trials, he said, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He said, I don't care what circumstance comes. I don't care what situation comes. I made up my mind. I'm going to live for the Lord, and I'm going to do right. And whatever, even if he kills me, I'm still going to serve him. I'm still going to bless him. I'm still going to love him. And I'm going to do everything in my power while I'm living to continue to establish my ways before him. I want God to look at me even in the face of my greatest trial and my greatest tribulation. I want God to be able to look at me and say, man, look at this guy. He, he served me when things were good and he served me when things were bad.
He served me when he had everything, and he served me when he had nothing. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, it is so imperative. If we are to avoid becoming prey to the enemy, it is so imperative that we learn to stand on the word of God. It is so imperative that we learn not to allow even the smallest opening in our life to spiritual influences, all they're looking for is the slightest opening, the slightest entry. There's another example of great grace in the face of great evil in the Old Testament. And that example is found in the man Joseph. Joseph had been sold by his brothers into slavery. He wound up living a great part of his life in Egypt, away from his kinsmen, away from his family and his father whom he loved dearly. <sighs> and then one day famine came, and his brothers found their way into Egypt seeking food and seeking help. And who should they stand before but Joseph? And they don't recognize him. They don't realize this is the brother they've sold into slavery. Oh, Joseph would have had a marvelous opportunity right now to get his revenge, wouldn't he? He had an excellent opportunity at this moment to retaliate for the betrayal of his brothers. But instead, in Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Hallelujah. What was Joseph saying? He was saying, you know, you guys sold me into slavery with the worst of intentions. You were acting as devilish as you could possibly act. But listen to what Joseph said. He said, but God. Even in that horrific circumstance, Joseph still saw the hand of God. He said, you did this for evil, but God! <laughs> Hallelujah! He said, but God had a different purpose. You know, the experience you're going through today, the horrors that you're going through today, the trial that you're going through today, the tragedy that you're going through today, God has something wonderful lined up down the road for you. Oh, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. Hallelujah. Joseph said, you know what, if y'all hadn't have sold me into slavery, if you hadn't have done what you did, I wouldn't have been in a position to work my way up through the government in Egypt and to become an important and powerful man so that today I'm in a position to preserve your lives. I'm in the position to preserve the lives of all your children and all of my family and all of my kinsmen and all of my nation. Hallelujah. Said, see, in the end, God turned it around and made something powerful and something good from it. I'm going to tell you something today. No matter how massive the tragedy, no matter how terrible your present circumstance, folks, God is bigger than your tragedy. He is bigger than your circumstance. He is able today to turn your terror into victory. Lastly, today I want to point out the necessity of humbling ourselves before the Lord, acknowledging that God knows far more than we will ever know. And it's imperative that we submit to His will and His ways. In 1 Peter 5, the same chapter we read this uh, portion we read this afternoon, the two verses immediately prior to verse number 8, verses 6 and 7, listen to what Peter tells the church. He said, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him 
for he careth for you. And then he says, be sober, be vigilant, because you're adversary. But he starts out by talking about humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. I'm going to tell you, people open the door to the enemy. They make themselves pray for the enemy. When they don't humble themselves before God and acknowledge, Lord, you're much bigger than I am. You're much smarter than I am. You know the end from the beginning. You know what's down the road. I believe there are times that God takes people from this life when they're young because he knows that if he were to allow them to live out their life, they would be facing hardship and hurt and tragedy. And he says, no, I'm going to spare them all that. But because we as human beings can't see ahead, we can't see the future, we stand there and question God, God, why do you do this, Lord? Why are you doing it? Why are you allowing this to happen? No, 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 no. Wrong response. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Lord, I don't understand. I don't get it. But this much I know. The Word of God says, All things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. I know the Word of God says that what the enemy means for evil, you mean for good. I know the Word of God tells me, Lord, that you can take my greatest hurt and my greatest trial and my greatest tribulation and turn it into a testimony and turn it into victory. We sang the song this afternoon. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. That song was written by a man as he was on a steamship headed back to his home. He was a missionary on a foreign field working for the Lord, and both his wife and daughter contracted some ailment while they were in the mission field and died. He had to bury them on foreign soil while he was working for King Jesus. His heart was broken. He was grieving. He was headed home so that he could find some comfort in the fellowship of his family and his church friends and other believers. He was taking a little break from his mission work. And on that steamship, this song arose in his soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, <laughs> thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, how many of us could ever go through the tragedy that this man experienced. How many of us could lose the love of our life and lose our child all at the same time and be able to look up toward heaven and say, Lord, it is well. It is well with my soul. Everything's all right because I know that even in the face of this trial and this tragedy, I know, God, that you're in control. I know, God, that somehow, somewhere, I can't even begin to fathom what it's going to be, but I know somehow, some way, you're going to turn this thing around. I know somehow, some way, this thing is going to benefit me in the end, and it will not destroy me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, submitting ourselves to God, humbling ourselves before the Lord, is the most important thing we can do to avoid becoming prey to the enemy. In James chapter 4 verse 7, I close this afternoon. The word of God declares, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What did Peter say to do when the enemy came after us? He said, whom resist ye steadfast in the faith? He said, resist him. Oh, James says the same thing. He said, resist the devil. But he said, before you do that, you need to humble yourself before the Lord. 
acknowledge that God and you are not on the same level. You don't have the same understanding. You don't have the same forward vision. You don't have the same understanding of the future. You don't have the same capabilities of wisdom. So therefore, humble yourself. Lord, I don't understand. I don't get it. But it is well with my soul. Or oh, you want to keep from becoming prey? Then friend, learn today this simple lesson. Learn what I'm telling you today. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And He will exalt you in due time. Look at Job. Job lost everything. But then in the end, everything was restored to him. Double. He wound up with twice as much as he lost to begin with. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you why. Because Job never for one minute thought he knew better than God. Job never for one minute brought accusation against God. Job never for one minute became angry with God. No, Job understood God is in control of my life. The devil doesn't control my life. God does. And every circumstance, every situation, my God has some divine purpose. I may be too blinded by my tears today to see that purpose. But just like me in the hospital room in 2000. But God, I may not see the purpose, but I'm going to stand on your word anyhow. And I'm going to believe that in the end there is some purpose. You're doing something great. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I don't want to open the door to the devil. I don't want to give opportunity to the enemy. I want to walk in victory. I want to live for God the way that God would have me to live for Him. And today, this is how not to be prey. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. I'm so used to saying that all the time. Amen. Father, we thank you, God. Lord, we love you so much. We're so grateful, God, for this time in the house of the Lord. Lord, my energy is low today. But God, I hope that this message has offered the people of God something that would encourage and help them, something that would inspire them. Lord, we want to keep the door closed on the enemy. We don't want to leave it ajar. We don't want to leave it open. We don't want even a crack for air to pass through. But we want to make sure that our soul, our lives, our bodies are forever secure. Lord, we want to make certain that we open no doors and we give him no opportunity to move into our lives and to begin to influence and to begin to vex and to oppress. Master, in the name of Jesus today, I ask God that you would deliver by your mighty power right now every individual under the sound of my voice, God, who's living with a spirit of fear, Every person, God, who today is living with a spirit of anxiety, every person, God, who's living with a spirit of anger, we bind that devil in the name of Jesus. There is no place in the life of a child of God for unchecked anger. There is no place in the life of a child of God for unchecked pain. There is no place in the life of a child of God for unchecked jealousy or spite, or revenge. Master, in the name of Jesus, we bind the spirit of addiction that would try today to place its mark upon lives. And we claim victory and liberty and complete and total deliverance from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, Lord, deliverance from drug addiction, deliverance from alcohol addiction, deliverance, God, from sexual addiction. Master, the spirit of lust today runs rampant in our world, and we claim victory as children of God. We close the door on that demon. We don't want to leave that door open, God. We close that door. 
We understand, God, today we can trust you. We can rely upon you. We know, God, that in every circumstance, in every situation, that you are working some great and wonderful purpose. Even when our life appears to lay about us in ashes. Oh God, you're working something wonderful. You're doing something great. Why? Because our God is great. Hallelujah. His power is magnificent. His ways are beyond finding out. Oh dear God, today, Lord, touch us, help us. Let this word today be an encouragement to our soul. Go with us from this place, O oh God. Continue to keep your people in your care. Protect us, Lord, from this virus, illness. Lord, heal the sick. Deliver today and save. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you and amen. I hope